This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome in to another edition of the Bartholomew Town Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Bartholomew. Today, we circle back on our coverage of the presidential election with Brown University's Dr. Wendy Schiller. And obviously, great to have Dr. Schiller back on the podcast. She, the chairwoman of the Brown University Department of Political Science and someone who has been on this show several times and a familiar voice to many, not only here in the state, but around the country as well. So we get into all things related to the presidential contest. And now, look, we're in the home stretch, no question about it. Here on B-Town, we're going to continue to uh, dig in more and more, not only on the local election side, as we sort of have been over the last month or so, we're going to ramp up our presidential election coverage. We've got some interesting guests coming up in the coming weeks, and I'll also be offering a little bit of commentary related to the debates and whatever else may come up here as Decision 2020 approaches, and I guess really it's underway when you consider the mail-in ballots, early voting options that are out there. Now, I'd be remiss not to mention that mail-in ballot applications, not the mail-in ballots themselves, but the applications to obtain a mail ballot here in Rhode Island, well, they're due today on October 13th. So uh, you better hustle that up if you haven't already gotten that done and you intend to vote with a mail ballot in either the, the context of sending it back in or dropping it off early at one of the 39 drop boxes located around the state. Now, I really want to hear from you out there. We have had some awesome dialogue, in particular, really this year. The interactive component of this podcast has really gone through the roof with COVID, with the social justice activities that have gone on throughout the country and here in Rhode Island in particular. And uh, it's great to get your take on things going on on the local level when it comes to elections and also on the national level. I want to get your feedback. So follow me on Twitter at Bill Bartholomew or Send me an email, bill at ripodcast.com. There's also the B-Town Facebook group. Good way to get there is www.btown.stream. That'll take you right to the Facebook group where we have a lot of interactive elements, including live streams like my coverage every Wednesday of Governor Raimondo's COVID-19 address. It's good to hear your feedback that really does drive the narrative from my perspective on what's going on, at least in part, right? And I want to keep it as interactive as possible when we are talking about this presidential election and what you're seeing out there, what you're feeling, what do you think about the debates that are going on, what do you think about everything with respect to COVID-19 and how that has specifically impacted the candidates in this election, let me know, you know, this is uh, is a two-way street here in Bartholomew Town. Love to have your feedback. Now, a lot going on in Rhode Island as well with Speaker Mattiello's associate campaign associate Jeff Britt's trial wrapping up just last week. We'll have more on that later this week. Stay tuned here on Bartholomew Town for what should be an interesting, at minimum, interesting conversation that'll be released on Friday. A couple other things real quick before we get to the conversation with Dr. Schiller. Recent episodes of Bartholomew Town include Senator Sheldon Whitehouse on a whole bunch of stuff, um, a conversation with Megan Cotter. Now, she's taking on Justin Price down in District 39. That is a typically conservative-leaning district. Miss Cotter of the Rhode Island Political Cooperative, which, by the way, the entire slate of candidates just recently endorsed by Bernie Sanders. How does the progressive message translate in rural areas that are typically leaning conservative. And by the way, I grew up down in that area. It's going to be fascinating to watch that one. So that episode's there for you. Plus conversations with Angelica Infante Green, the commissioner of education here in Rhode Island, the NEARI head, Bob Walsh, and outgoing state representative Moira Walsh kind of talking about her experience up at uh, the General Assembly. She talks about poker, drinking, sandwiches, and um, what it's like to have that sort of outsider voice inside the General Assembly. So that's there for you wherever you listen to this show, ripodcast.com, Spotify, Apple, Alexa, whatever. Just want to plug some of the past episodes. And I really appreciate everyone who has become a B-Town insider on our Patreon account. You can support the independent journalism, opinion, analysis, and entertainment that B-Town has become known for for as little as $3 a month. And if you pledge $10 per month, you get exclusive content. That's patreon.com slash Town. Or just click the support icon wherever you're listening right now. Okay, let's get to it. Dr. Wendy Schiller, Brown University Political Science Department, Decision 2020, here we come. All right, so we're coming off of the president and his many of his associates, COVID positive, uh, a mannered, I suppose, vice presidential debate. And now we're heading into this wacky situation where there's going to be potentially a virtual debate later this week on the presidential side, what are voters looking for right now? The suburban moms out there, as we 
keep hearing about the the voters who haven't made up their minds yet. What could what will signal to them that hey, I need to go Trump or I need to go Biden or sit this one out or go for the third party candidate? You know, I I think it's prospective voting uh, this year more so than retrospective voting. You know, many many moons ago, Ronald Reagan asked a question in 1980: Are you better off today than you were four years ago? And I I think that would have been President Trump's question to the American uh, people had the economy stayed uh, strong and vibrant. And of course, if COVID-19 hadn't appeared in a worldwide pandemic. So now when voters are thinking, okay, it looks like we're in this until at least June of 21. It looks like this is the way our life will be. Question is, who's going to handle that better moving forward? Who's going to secure a safe vaccine? Who's going to take it seriously? Who's going to try to work with people in terms of schools and and find a way to help people who've been who've lost their jobs? And I think in that way, Biden has positioned himself as somebody who will try to do all those things in a calmer, more predictable manner than President Trump. So it's not clear Biden will do that many things differently than Donald Trump. Possibly he'll wear a mask more frequently. I think we know that. <laughs> but but in terms of policy and the federal government's push to research a, a vaccine and distribute it, I don't see that that will be all that different. But I think that people will f- po- probably starting to think, uh, I'm a little tired of the chaos. I'm a little nervous because the president infected, you know, many of his staff members and uh, other people who attended the Rose Garden ceremony. We don't know how the president himself got infected. So you say to yourself, what's the if they're about the same, what's the calmer, more soothing alternative? And in that way, I think that is possibly what pushes independent voters to Biden ultimately. And as as you know, we'll talk about it probably today. The election is now. You know, you think it might be three weeks from now. Maybe people will hold off and vote on Election Day, but millions of people are voting every single day now. Right. And even today we're airing on October 13th. This is the deadline for mail, mail and ballot applications here in Rhode Island. And you've got to think, I, I happen to know some people have already received theirs. And it's certainly an unusual election in that sense where you're going to have decisions being made really coming off of the first debate, which to me anyway, was one of the lowest points that I can think of in American politics or anything that I've ever seen. It it seemed to me that it was representative of the chaos that Donald Trump's administration has kind of become known for. Yes and no. I mean, I thought the debate was uh, not surprising. I didn't think that Donald Trump would be calm and uh, obey the rules. He never does. He never has been. He wasn't really even with Hillary Clinton in 2016. He was a little bit more circumspect, but he's been emboldened by winning when everybody thought he would be lo- he would lose. And I think he came out ablazing and wanted to sort of uh, throw Joe Biden off his game, but he didn't succeed. And in that way, that strategy, if you want to call it that, backfired on the president. I thought he dominated the debate. I thought in that way he won the debate because he had more airtime. I thought it seemed to me. And he was more aggressive. And But he did not succeed in showing the American public Joe Biden, uh, a frail guy, a guy who didn't know what he was talking about, a guy who couldn't put two sentences together. You know, this this none of that happened. Joe Biden stayed on message on point and for the most part, with some major exceptions, uh, didn't lose his cool. I mean, calling the president of the United States a liar to his face may be some people's uh, desire, but I still found it jarring. And I was I was probably more surprised at Joe Biden's behavior. But, you know, he's trying to appeal to a very wide spectrum of people in the Democratic Party. And some of the younger voters in the party really want to see somebody who's going to fight back against uh, Donald Trump and the Trump administration's policies. So in that sense, it wasn't a liability for him because in some ways it might have attracted more support and more energy from younger voters. Certainly watching your live tweeting during the debate. And uh, that's sort of in line with what your perspective was and your radio appearances after. I wonder from watching the that debate and also, of course, the vice presidential how much the left of left elements of not only the Democratic Party, but independent voters, look, if you're far left, quote unquote, you want Donald Trump out. There's no question about it. At the same time, you see a very careful tightrope being walked with respect to Biden, not say, saying that he does not endorse the Green New Deal uh, with fracking, um, playing into 
a more moderate perspective, which of course is what he is. But do you think that this will leave many of the folks who are of the Bernie camp, of the Elizabeth Warren camp, or independents who lean liberal uh, to say, you know what, Biden's not my guy. I'm going to stay home and hope that the best happens in, ter- and my, in terms of the future of the country with whoever wins. Well, you know, I, I said earlier that I thought that voters would be more prospective than retrospective. Uh, and in that sense, I know that the, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party was disappointed in, in some ways with the Obama administration. But where Obama was aggressive was using his presidential regulatory power on uh, carbon emissions, on fuel economy standards, and uh, not issuing and issuing um, some offshore oil uh, drilling, but protecting Anwar in, in the Alaska National Refuge, Wildlife Refuge. So when you think about what could come next in a second Trump administration versus sort of what uh, Obama and Biden did, whether you're retrospective or you're prospective, you have to think there's a much better chance I'm going to get the policies I want, particularly on climate change. I mean, I think there is no question that Joe Biden will go back into the Paris Accords or not withdraw completely. There is no question that he will uh, be active in um, reversing some of the Trump regulations that have been issued already that allow more methane gas release and and other types of uh, policies that are known to be bad for the environment. So you have to decide. You've know you've seen for four years of Trump, you've seen the regulatory powers on the environment be reduced. Uh, uh, to protect the environment, you have to say to yourself, we know there'll be more of that under Trump coming forward. We don't know what Biden will bring, but we know Biden won't bring that. So it just depends on on the kind of calculation that these voters make. I hope everybody votes, Trump supporter, Biden supporter, Green New Deal supporter, whoever it is, I think everybody should vote. I think staying home was very expensive for the Democratic Party in 2016. I think some of that was made up by 2018 when a lot of people who stayed home in 2016 got out the door to vote in 2018, particularly voting for women of color and giving the House back to the Democrats. So the question is, do you wanna see a repeat of 2016? Do you want four more years of Donald Trump? Do you think that will be more beneficial to the cause of climate change than electing a more moderate Joe Biden in your, in, you know, your eyes if you're progressive but he's nowhere close to Donald Trump on, on the environment. Yeah, it's going to come down to just making a pragmatic decision for sure. There's no question about it. But also not just pragmatic. I think also, you know, emotional. I think there's a lot of things that have come with the Trump administration, particularly on issues of white supremacy, of um, uh, representation for people of, of color, under, you know, of color, uh, but certainly police violence. Uh, I think... I think emotionally, if you think about what kind of country you want to live in and the rhetoric that politicians use and the president uses, I think there there is grounds to argue that even the most left of the left uh, should be invested in, as you said, defeating Donald Trump. Going to be interesting to see how it plays out, no doubt about it. What about the, on the vice presidential side? It was raised and neither of the candidates in the vice presidential debate really got into this in in, in any detail at all. In terms of the age of both Joe Biden and Donald Trump, they'll be the oldest president in American history. So you've really got to think that, hey, look, the vice president it may be a dark thought or whatever, but there's a very good chance that they may be called upon to become uh, to serve as president. How much do, do vice presidential, presidential candidates um, impact this election in terms of a voter's decision, an undecided's decision? And do you think coming off of last week's vice presidential debate, there is uh, anything was generated that may sway a voter in a particular direction? Um, Bill, that's a great question. I've actually been really struck on how um, how little focus is, has been on the vice presidential nominee, particularly in the Democratic Party, the first African-American and South Asian woman ever nominated to be the VP. And you would have thought that might have presented some obstacles for the Democrats in certain parts of the country or uh, in, among certain demographic uh, groups of voters. And then Mike Pence is a known commodity. He was, you know, I was a congressperson, governor of Indiana, and um, and now vice president. So I've been struck at how little it matters. And I think the reason it, it doesn't matter is I think most people think either one of them could run the country. You know, as opposed to 2008, when Sarah Palin was the vice presidential choice for John McCain on the Republican ticket, people watched her and thought, I don't think she can run the country. I'm actually quite concerned 
that she shouldn't be president of the United States. And I don't think voters on either side of the political aisle feel that way. I think Republicans fear Kamala Harris precisely because she could be president of the United States. And I think most people think she is perfectly capable of doing that. And I think Democrats fear Mike Pence because they feel like he would blossom as president and certainly implement extraordinarily conservative policies. So I think voters have decided they'd be fine. I'm not worried about this, but they're actually making their choice on Trump or no Trump. As much as Biden would like to say this is also about him and the positives he might bring to the Oval Office, it's really, do you really want to live under four more years of what is a chaotic, but in, for Republicans, been quite effective um, administration? Discover over 200 episodes of Rhode Island's podcast of record, the Bartholomew Town Podcast, on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your pods. Or head over to our website, ripodcast.com. We saw big victories from the I, the Rhode Island Political Cooperative and, and broadly speaking, the, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party here in Rhode Island. I wondered how much, at the time, I wondered how much of that was just people seeking outsider, new voices, trying to push against the old guard here in Rhode Island with Speaker Mattiello on, well, he, he not on trial, but Jeff Britt, his campaign associate on trial, and, and just a lot of I guess Rhode Island's sort of reputation for being a a good old boys club, how much of it was people voting based on progressive ideologies versus voting based upon a need for change? Do you sense that that question might translate in in a national context where someone who is a moderate is just voting because they want change? You know, that is so it's a uh, I think we have to uh, unpack that question. I think Rhode Island, uh, particularly uh, starting with the uh, the victory of Gina Raimondo in the Democratic primary in 2014, I think turned a corner. Teresa Piper Weed had become president of the Rhode Island Senate. So we had female leadership. But it was different when a woman defeated uh, two opponents in the Democratic primary and then went on. Um, to win a very tight race the first time against Alan Fung for the governorship. And that turned a corner, I think, in terms of gender and gender um, mobilization in Rhode Island. And since then, we've seen an extraordinarily rapid ascent of women in Rhode Island politics. Certainly, the Providence City Council was not run by women in those days. And of course, now it is with Spina Matos heading that up. And you see victories uh, against Harold Metz. And that was a very fascinating uh, race, you know, a, a woman of color, a younger woman of color versus a well-established uh, man of color who was well thought of by a lot of his constituents, but did not really have the kinds of um, policy positions, particularly on same-sex marriage uh, and certainly abortion, those sorts of positions that, that are the hallmark of the Democratic Party now. So I think this is driven by women. I think it's driven by women of color. And I think uh, I think the torch has been already passed in many ways. I think the next you know battlefront will be the assembly, the general assembly. We'll see if uh, Nick Mattiel survives his election, which is I think going to be a tighter election than than he wants. And and what happens to that sort of very male dominated infrastructure in the general assembly? I think that, you know these changes aren't going to go away. This this momentum, this tide is not going to roll back out. And on the national scale, do you think that similarly, some somehow vice, well, not vice president, but vice presidential candidate Kamala Harris might have a similar effect on voters who are, are, are leaning towards, hey, women, women of color, fresh blood? Well, I think I think she acquitted herself very, very well in the debate in the following sense. I think. You know, and I tweeted a little bit about this, as you as you alluded to, Uh, she was really in a very difficult, constrained position. You know, we know from political science and just political observation, voters don't like overly aggressive women. They don't like they didn't like it that Kamala Harris pointed her finger at Joe Biden in the presidential debates. So she was up against Pence. They were sitting down, which, of course, restricts, you know, any kind of body language that you can express and use to your advantage. And Kamala Harris is a very charismatic speaker and Pence is a very good debater. So she had to find a way of sort of saying, listen, I'm not going to let you bully me. Although he did absorb, he did use most of the airtime in the first 40 minutes of the debate. But I am going to stand up for myself in a way that it that looks like I'm standing up for the voter. 
And I think that was really important. And I think she succeeded in doing that throughout as the debate wore on, she got better and better at it. But I don't think she made any specific pitch towards women of color or for uh, younger progressive voters. I think she was aiming directly at suburban women, notably either suburban independent women or Republican women who voted for Trump and are displeased with him now. I think that was really something where she you know, wanted to uh, make her point that she's a woman, she's tough, she's been a prosecutor, uh, but she can represent a broad swath of the voting population. So that's what I saw from the debate, which makes me think she won't be the kind of catalyst, at least for young people and young progressives in terms of multiracial coalitions and uh, thinking about Black Lives Matter, I don't think she will be a catalyst per se. Uh, so I think that's that's a, tr a Biden campaign decision. They could have gone either way with Kamala Harris and, and they chose to frame her and the campaign in a, I would, I would say, more moderate way. Last couple of minutes here, your take on, and this is such an annoying term, but the media and how this has been, uh, this election has been presented you know, I think back to we really started to see the narrow casting happen, certainly in the 2000 presidential election. But I think to 2004, I was in school at that point, and it really became clear, OK, if you're getting your news from The Daily Show or you're getting your news from Tucker Carlson's takes on Crossfire, what there's going to be a very significantly different approach to how you think about the presidential race. This year, more than ever, it's it's a given that narrow casting dominates media, but do you think it's been fair by and large? You mean the, you mean the sort of self-selection of the media and then the different kinds of political slants that the media takes? Exactly. Uh, that's a good question. I found it to be interesting, uh, mostly on Fox, because I think that CNN decided in 2016 they were going all in on Trump. They gave Trump two and a half months, at least, of massively free publicity, and I think helped spur his road to the nomination of the Republican Party. And they were all in on Trump because that was helping them with ratings. But they seem to have um, reversed course entirely and become quite antagonistic towards Trump, and their ratings are doing really well. So, you know, these corporate decisions by the media to pivot to try to get a particular audience has really affected the kind of coverage that they're delivering. Fox, on the other uh, hand, is slightly, ever so slightly moderated in the sense that some of their anchors certainly lost a major anchor who was sort of, uh, you know, not anti-Trump, but would call Trump out. But they've had other anchors uh, who've made multiple speeches that have criticized the president. The only sort of bastion of pure support uh, is basically the morning show and then Sean Hannity and Laura Ingraham. But but everything else in between has become a little bit more balanced. And um, that's been an interesting trend to me to watch because you have to think about demographics. You know, for the first time in 20 years, the polling amongst people over the age of 65, which is a big Fox demographic, is tied between the Democrat and Republican presidential campaign candidate. That's the first time in 20 years. Republicans have an 8 to 10 to 12 percent advantage in that group normally. But this has been since June. So seniors have shifted which means that demographic that watches Fox News, is a, their ratings are really high, but the demographic that is all in for President Trump that watches Fox News is shrinking. And I think you're seeing a little bit of adjustment on the part of Fox News to that effect. Fascinating stuff. Last question, law and order, COVID-19, I guess climate change, or just the need for change of scenery. What will be the dominant, or something else altogether, what will be the dominant issue Obviously, the election's underway, but when we look back on it, we'll say, what is the dominant issue, the doctrine, if you will, of the 2020 presidential contest? I, I do think that the predominant issue will really very much depend on where you live. I think COVID in those areas that has been so hard, uh, so hard hit, I think COVID really dominates a lot across the country. But there are areas in the Midwest and the West that uh, until now hadn't been greatly affected, but their economies are affected. Because when the East Coast and the West Coast and the Southeast shuts down or slows down, that's you know fewer consumers for goods produced in the Midwest and the West. So I think that the economic ripple effects of COVID will affect some of those elections. I'm thinking Kansas, Colorado, Arizona, uh, Minnesota. 
But that COVID itself, I think, is also going to affect particularly Arizona and Florida in that uh, seniors have reacted to it by shifting their allegiance from Trump to Biden. If that holds up in the voting as much as it's in the polls, I think that'll be the single biggest variable, actually, uh, if Biden wins, that would give Biden a victory. Dr. Wendy Schiller, she chairs the political science department at Brown University. As always, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, Bill. This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Hey, give me a follow on Twitter at Bill Bartholomew. We'll talk to you next time. At HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits, and 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com slash employers.